Hey everyone, welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm Adam, and the focus of our lecture today is on perceptual symbol systems. The article by today is by Lawrence Barcelau. The title of the article is Perceptual Symbol Systems, and this article was published in 1999 in the journal Behavioral and Brain Sciences. So in the last few lectures, we have been focusing primarily on the implementation level of understanding an information processing system. For example, we focused on addressing questions such as the following. Which neural regions or brain networks are involved in processing syntactic information? Which neural regions or brain networks are involved in processing semantic information? Which neural regions or brain networks are involved in processing information about arms versus legs versus the mouth? So those are all questions in neuroscience uh, concerning the implementation level of an information processing system, for example, language. Today, we will turn to focus primarily on the algorithmic level of understanding an information processing system. And recall that this is the representation and algorithm level in MAR 1982, which we introduced in lecture one, Introduction to Cognitive Science. Regarding this algorithmic level of analysis, recall that MAR asks, what is the representation for the input and output? And what is the algorithm for the transformation? So today, we will think about the representational format of cognition. Some questions for today. Are our thoughts analog mental representations similar to images and pictures? Or are our thoughts arbitrary, for example, digital mental representations, similar to a computer language? Is the cognitive system modular and encapsulated from the sensory and motor systems, right? The sandwich view of cognition. Or is the cognitive system intimately integrated with the sensory and motor systems? Some questions for today. So let's go ahead and contrast amodal symbol systems with perceptual symbol systems by getting a clear view of how these uh, systems are distinct. These different approaches to cognition are distinct. Um, we'll be able to appreciate Barcelau's perceptual symbols system. So Amodal symbol systems. This is a view that was made popular, right? Popularized um, in the 1950s um, when the classical computational theory of mind or cognition became very influential for cognitive science. Okay. According to amodal symbol systems, symbols are amodal in the sense that they are represented in a different system than the perceptual states that produced them, okay? So if you think about the term modality, this usually refers or indicates a sensory modality, right? So a modal system would be one that includes the sensory modalities, an amodal system would be a system that does not include the sensory modalities, right? So amodal systems are not going to include uh, sensory modalities, including vision, olfaction, audition, right? Tactile perception and whatnot, okay? Another way to think about this is you can think about your computer, right? The nature of the way that your computer stores information, for example, it may have information about dogs, right? Your information may have stored information about dogs, but the way that your computer is stored, that information is not in the form of images that look like dogs, right? All the information that's in your computer, it's not stored in a modal specific way. 
right? Where all the information is in the format of uh, an image or of a perceptual representation, but rather your computer stores information in the form of ones and zeros in some um, amodal format, right? And that's sort of the important insight here or the important point on this view is that similarly, some aspect of human cognition, right? Higher level cognition is stored, represented in a format that is different from the format of our sensory modalities and also distinct from the format of our motor actions, right? Recall that the sandwich view of cognition holds that cognition is the middle part of the sandwich, right? Distinct from sensation or perception and action, okay? So on this amodal symbol systems view, symbols are also arbitrary, right? Symbols are not only amodal, free of modality specific information, but also the symbols are arbitrary in the sense that the structure of a symbol does not correspond to the perceptual state that produced it, right? Um, and consider how words in a language are arbitrary, right? The word dog doesn't look like a dog, right? The, the a certain logical symbol, right? Like a one and a zero doesn't look like a true or false or something that it may represent, okay? So that's what we mean by this amodal symbol systems view, okay? Is that the symbols are amodal and that the symbols are arbitrary. The basic assumption underlying amodal symbol systems is that perceptual states, right? Like something that you see, for example, your perceptual states are transduced into a completely new representational system that describes these states amodally. For example, in a computer language, I think that's a convenient way to think about it, but there's different um, representational formats that you could use to try to articulate uh, an, an amodal system, right? So for example, we may use predicate logic or predicate calculus or a computer language, okay? As a result, the internal structure of amodal symbols is unrelated to the perceptual states that produce them with conventional associations establishing reference instead. Okay, so the connection between the word dog and the thing in the world that it represents, it's that connection is not established through a resemblance connection, but rather it's established through a conventional association, right? The word dog doesn't look like a dog. That's not what's connecting those two, right? What's connecting the two is that the word dog is conventionally used, right? To pick out that item, right? Like there's a convention such that I will only use that word to pick out these things in the world, right? Um, so that's what's meant by a conventional association establishes the reference, okay? So you know, in a sense, this view, this amodal symbol systems view is the view that higher order cognition, right? Like beliefs, uh, desires, counterfactual thinking, like if this happens then this will happen or in another possible world, blah, 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 right? This higher order cognition is almost like it's in the form of something like a mental ease, right? It's structured something like a language, although it's not gonna be a particular natural language, right? Remember that Fodor is not committed to mental ease being English. It's just that mental ease is structured, right? In the sort of way that English is sort of structured, okay? Okay, and here we see a nice figure showing uh, or demonstrating sort of the main idea here is that initially we have a perceptual state. So I might see a chair in my apartment, okay? And then from that perceptual state, right? Because at one level, at a lower level, this is involving my sensory organs or sensory apparatus. So what happens, what needs to happen is a transduction needs to take place, like a rewriting or a transformation from that perceptual language or uh, state of information to a non-perceptual language or non-perceptual representational format, 
Okay, so there needs to be a transduction from one representational format to another representational format. Okay, going from sensation or perception to cognition. Okay, and that's what we see here is that through the transduction, we now have something in higher level cognition, right? That doesn't look like chairs anymore, right? Our visual experience is of chairs, but if you like take a peep into the representational format in our cognition, our cognitive state or our mental state, you see that here it's taking a more symbolic approach to representing the thing in the world, okay? And here you see that we might use something like a predicate calculus, uh, predicate logic, uh, feature lists, or there may be different symbolic methods for characterizing the non-perceptual yet representational format of higher order cognition, okay? Cool. And always remember that the amodal view is in line with the classical computational view of cognition, like the mind is a computer, okay? So similar to how words like dog have arbitrary relations to entities in the world, such as a real dog, amodal symbols have arbitrary relations to perceptual states. An example of a non-perceptual representational scheme is predicate logic or predicate calculus, okay? So you might ask yourself, okay, well, if I'm not thinking, if I'm not cognizing in images of chairs and objects, then like, what's the representational format look like, right? It's sort of an abstract notion. So although depending on the type of theorist you are, you might fill in the representational format with different uh, uh, um, different approaches like feature lists, semantic networks, frame schemata or predicate calculus, right? You may adopt different technical representational languages. Uh, I wanna just give you one example, right? To just help you get the idea, okay? And then you can always just substitute this with another format that you like better or you think is more that is more productive or explanatory power explanatorily powerful okay so let's just go ahead and think about this in terms of predicate logic okay this is one way in which we might represent the world right we might represent the world cognitively but not perceptually okay so that's what we mean by non-perceptual representational scheme Okay, so in our minds, our higher order cognition may look something like this right here, right? And here I provided just an example of predicate logic, right? And notice that this is not propositional logic, right? This is predicate logic, and that we're, we're reaching down into the predicate level and not just at the propositional level, right? So here we see that uh, this symbol right here is called an existential quantifier. Right? And then what essentially what this is saying is that there exists some X, right? That's what, what this X stands for. There exists some X such that X is L and X is S and X is B, okay? So that might be like the structure of our cognition where we're saying there exists some X such that X has legs for L, has a seat for S and has a back for B, right? And when you say, right, when you, put together that, um, that um, predicate logic structure, right? This may pick out something that is a chair, right? You're not, in your mind, you don't have an image of your chair, but what you do is you have a structure, right? Where you say there is something, and then by conjoining or um, using conjunction to combine predicates, right? Just think about all the properties that a chair has, right? Maybe it has like 312 properties, for example. Well, we can just conjoin those 312 properties and we can say there is there exists some X that has all those properties, right? And we can then uniquely pick out chairs as opposed to dogs or whatnot using this sort of predicate logic structure, okay? 
Uh, and here's just another example. This one is going to be an example of a universal proposition rather than an existential proposition. Okay. So in in addition to having thoughts of there is there exists something that is a chair, we could also have thoughts like all chairs are like this, or all dogs are like this, right? Like all men are mortal, so on. Okay. So to form a universal proposition, we can use this non-perceptual representational scheme, right? And here, this is just a universal quantifier for, so this says for all X, um, X is L and X is S and X is B, right? Or in more common English, for all X, X has legs and X has a seat and X has a back, okay? So, you know, we can get more technical with our predicate logic, but the idea here is that we can capture and cognize things about the world in a non-imagistic, non-perceptual format, right? This format here is very different than the format of our perceptions and our actions, okay? And so the idea is that the body picks up perceptual information and executes motor actions, but the mind, right? Cognition, higher order cognition is operating in this type of format. For example, in predicate logic, right? And then it's through a, um, a process of transduction that it goes from sensory format or perceptual format to predicate logic and then back down to actions, okay? So that, that's sort of the view here, okay? Notice, importantly, that the representational scheme of predicate calculus or predicate logic does not resemble, look like, or analogically relate to our perceptual experiences, okay, of chairs or whatnot, right? There's nothing in this uh, symbolism that looks like a chair, okay? And I just wanna reiterate that this, uh, the classical computational view of cognition based on the model of the mind as a computer assumes that cognition is represented in this kind of amodal format, right? This kind of format, um, depending on who we are, right? Like I might be a, a certain type of scholar that thinks that predicate calculus is the way to go, but you may also adopt an amodal symbol systems view, but argue for a different uh, format, right? Like maybe you like feature lists instead. Okay. So it's just to point out that the nature of the representational format can still be a little bit different within this framework or within this view, a modal view. Okay. All right. So now that we have an idea of what the a modal symbol systems view of cognition looks like, right? We have a clear, um, idea of what the sandwich view of cognition looks like, right? Let's go ahead and look at the contrasting view that is advanced by Barcelau. This view is called perceptual symbol systems. And according to perceptual symbol systems, symbols are modal in the sense that they are represented in the same systems as the perceptual states that produced them, right? So recall that what we mean by modal or modality is sensory modalities. So uh, a, a modal, a symbol that is modal is a symbol that includes uh, sensory or perceptual qualities, okay? And this is just to say that sensory information is integrated with motor and cognitive information here, or that the systems sensory, motor, and cognitive are integrated on this view. Whereas in the previous view, the amodal view, the systems are encapsulated from each other and distinct, okay? So on the perceptual symbol systems view, symbols are also analogical, okay? In the sense that the structure of a symbol corresponds at least somewhat to the perceptual state that produced it, okay? so perceptual symbols partly resemble their original perceptual states on this view, right? Recall that on the previous view, the predicate logic formulation in cognition did not resemble the state, the perceptual state, 
right? The cognitive state did not resemble the perceptual state. Here on the perceptual symbol systems view, there is going to be some resemblance. It might not be a perfect resemblance, but there's some non-arbitrary relationship, okay? Just like we can see in this figure, although this symbol doesn't look exactly like the perceptual state, right? There is some analogical relationship between the two and it's not completely arbitrary, right? In the, in the way that like these symbols, there exists an X so-and-so would be related to the chair, okay? So the basic assumption underlying perceptual symbol systems is that subsets of perceptual states in sensory motor systems are extracted and stored in long-term memory to function as symbols. As a result, the internal structure of perceptual symbols is modal and they are analogically related to the perceptual states that produce them, okay? So just think about now how different this is than the computer view, right? The previous view was thinking about cognition as working very similar to how your computer might handle information, right? Here we have something different, right? Here we have the perceptual state and then rather than transduction, right? From one format to another, we just have extraction, right? which doesn't imply that the two formats from, sen from sensory perception to cognition are of distinct types, okay? And we see here that this looks like the chair somewhat, but is missing some of the details, right? It's sort of like a sketch, uh, um, a rough sketch of the world rather than um, a perfectly high fidelity copy in the mind. Okay, and this is gonna be important for the next few slides, okay? So what we're getting here is we're from perception, right? Through selective attention, like when I see a chair, I'm gonna selectively attend to certain features of the chair and extract those features from perception, store them in long-term memory. The way that this information is stored in long-term memory is not as a holistic image. What I'm not doing is taking that exact image from the world and boom, just storing it in my mind, okay? Rather, I'm extracting parts from the perceptual experience and I'm storing parts in long-term memory. This is super important, right, to Barcelona's view because Remember that one of the most important things about cognition and why I, I like teaching introduction to cognitive science through the lens of language is that one of the most important things about cognition is its productive nature, right? The great thing about human cognition is that we're not just sort of recorders of the past, right? Just sort of an album of old pictures from our past, but that we can generate uh, new ideas, we can write new papers, give new lectures, play new music, have new conversations, right? Engage, uh, create new paintings, or right? we can do all these new productive generative things with cognition, right? And that's the awesome thing about cognition. One of the truly gnarly things about cognition is that it's productive in a very original generative sort of way. And so in order to capture that, in order to have a model of cognition with that property of productivity, we need to store parts and not holes. Think about it, right? This is sort of very similar to us storing noun phrases, verb phrases, storing categories, right? Having categories to work with rather than just storing full sentences. It's because by storing those linguistic parts that we can then be productive to generate new sentences, right? So there's something, there's a similar move going on here, but in terms of like psychological theory rather than just um, linguistic theory, right? But the, the motivation and the move is very similar. 
is that what we want is we don't want to store sentences. We want to store parts, right? Component parts so that way we can generate new sentences in language. Similarly, we don't want to store whole experiences, but parts of experiences so that way we can combine parts of experiences to generate new cognitions, new imaginings, and all sorts of things, right? Think about the craziest dream that you had, right? Maybe you were, you know, doing some really crazy, unbelievable stuff, right? Maybe you were, you had wings and were flying, or, you know, you were battling, you know, some creature that you had never seen before. You're like, how could I think these things if I've never seen these things? Well, partly because the way that we store this information on this view is we store this information in parts, right? And that allows us to, from experiences of horses and then things with horns, we can now combine parts, right? Like, ah, what if a horse had a horn? Well, now we have like an idea of a unicorn or so-and-so, okay? So that's the important thing here for Barcelau, right, is that, we're gonna extract, boom, from perception, store parts into our long-term memory, okay? And they're gonna be stored as symbols that we can then use, reuse, okay? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and just really sort of make this point clear on this next slide, okay? So I gave you an example of Right. If you if you recall from this slide, this was an example of non-perceptual representational scheme or format. Okay. So if we want to represent the world, but in a non-perceptual way, predicate logic was one way that we might do that. Right. If we were like a computer, you might build a robot or an AI that may cognize in such a format. Okay. Alternatively, this is an example of a perceptual representational scheme, okay? And that would be, for example, images or photographs, okay? I'm gonna make sure to emphasize that perceptual symbol systems are not just images, okay? But an image is an example of a perceptual representational scheme, okay? Like you might be like a British empiricist and think that this is the nature of the content of our thoughts, like just images, right? Um, and you might think that um, this works fine, right? The image is a satisfactory perceptual representational scheme, okay? So an image or photograph of a dog resembles a perceptual experience of a dog, right? And, and we can see here, that unlike the predicate logic example, this picture or image right here, this looks like my dog, right? Because this is a photo of my dog, right? My dog's name is Loki, he's a yellow lab, and here's four images of my beautiful dog, right? And what we see is that each image, there's four images right here, and they're, they're properly identified as, accurate images of my dog because of the, re the resemblance of the picture to reality, right? Like when I took this picture in the world, it really did look like this, like the whole part, right? Like my dog was, my dog looks like this. My dog was on grass and it was sunny and there was a shadow here, right? So this whole picture is like a, a high fidelity representation of the world. Right. So in, in the sense, this picture is holistic, right? Like we're taking the whole thing from the world and putting the whole thing in the picture. Okay. Similarly here, this whole thing, this whole image is like a duplicate of what the world looked like when I took the picture. Okay. Similarly here and similarly here. Right. So if the mind was just purely like a recording machine, like a perceptual recorder. Like you might think that maybe the mind is just a, like a type of photograph machine, right? Like I see the world, I take a picture of the world and I just store it in my mind, right? If you think that the mind is a sort of recorder, this is sort of like the more traditional empiricist view, 
like the old school empiricist view is that when we experience the world, first our mind is a blank slate. And then I go out and engage in some perceptual experiences. And I'm sort of like adding photographs to my blank slate. So now it's no longer blank, but more like a, a photo album that stores all these records, right? Of my perceptual experiences, okay? What I'm trying to say here is that importantly, perceptual symbol systems, it's, it's a step beyond this view, right? The, the view that the mind is just a recording machine that stores images. If that was the case, then in my mind, I would only have these four images of my dog, for example, right? And what that means is I couldn't have any other cognitions of my dog. Like I would be restricted to only replaying these four, right? Like I could think of my dog like this, or like this, or like this, or like that, but no other way, right? The important thing for Barcelona's view and why perceptual symbol systems is not just a recording view of perception is that on according to perceptual symbol systems, I'm not just storing like brute records, but rather I've, I've extracted parts through experience Right, so I've like extracted part of my dog's face. I've extracted part of his hands. I've extracted his tongue, right? And what I'm doing is by extracting parts from different experiences, right? I'm now building a, a model or a, a symbol in my mind, right? That I can reuse and I can replay in imagination and I, I can now be productive with it, right? So what I can do is from like these four experiences by taking the parts, extracting the parts and building a model in my mind, right? You see, now I can move my dog around in my mind because I've put the parts together in a configuration symbolically that I can now generate and do things with it that's not available if all I did was store the full experience as a brute record in my mind, okay? That's a, a very important point. I think that it's often underappreciated in the literature, right? Some empiricists are just gonna think, well, if I have an argument against, you know, like uh, traditional empiricism, then that applies to all empiricism, right? Well, be careful, right? Because there's something cool and unique going on with the perceptual symbol systems, right? And that we're not just storing brute records, right? But that there's a productive nature to this. And so we're going to have to retool arguments against empiricism if we want to argue against perceptual symbol systems, all right? And that's just to emphasize the point that this is a much more nuanced view than just traditional uh, empiricism, okay? And that's why I think that it's so awesome is because we're trying to sort of take the best from empiricistic views, but also account for the productive nature of cognition, okay? And that was sort of one of the beautiful contributions from the amodal systems view, right? So of course, we're not just, Barcelona was not just saying, throw away the amodal systems view. It's completely garbage, but rather, no, there's a lot of wonderful insights from that view. Like we want to retain productivity, right? We want to retain some of the other properties that I'm going to mention here later in the lecture, right? Like that uh, conceptual systems should be able to account for abstract concepts. Uh, conceptual systems should be able to identify types and tokens, right? I'll, I'll go ahead and list some of these things that conceptual systems should do, right? And later in the subsequent slide, okay? But what I want to say right here is that perceptual symbol system is going to try to take the best from the amodal view, like what should we retain, like these properties, but then we're gonna to try to account for those properties using uh, an, empiric an empirical, right? Or at least uh, a view that is more congenial to perception and action, okay? A view that's gonna to try to integrate perception and action into the conceptual view, okay? Into the conceptual system, okay? All right, so, um, Unlike perceptual symbols, images, and photographs, and recording systems more generally are holistic, 
rather than componential or compositional, and therefore are not productive in the way that human thoughts and cognitions are. Okay. Unlike holistic images, perceptual symbols are componential or compositional. Our Barcelona uses the word componential, right? Components. You may often hear the word compositional. Same idea, right? Decomposable into parts, right? Perceptual symbols are componential in the sense that perceptual symbols are parts that can be combined productively to generate new thoughts and cognitions. It is important to emphasize here that perceptual symbols are componential, not holistic. So perceptual symbols are not simply images as older empirical views have often assumed. Okay. So what's included in a perceptual state? Well, Barslau suggests that a perceptual state can contain these two things. All right. One is an unconscious neural representation of physical input. Okay. And this is sort of like a requirement, right? If you have a perception, there needs to be some sort of information, right? Stored at like a physical neural level. Okay. And that may also include an optional conscious experience. Okay. So the um, it's not always necessary that there's a conscious component, but the there needs to be a biologically based component to it. Okay. And you can think of um, well, I'll unpack this here in a moment. Okay. Once a perceptual state arises, so you have a perception, a subset of that perception is extracted via selective attention and stored permanently in long-term memory. The storage and reactivation of perceptual symbols operates at the level of perceptual components, not at the level of holistic perceptual experiences. To be clear, perceptual, uh, perceptual systems implement conceptual systems and not recording systems, okay? So on this view, PSS, perceptual symbol systems, this is not the view that perception is just a recording mechanism. All right, so Barcelow suggests that related perceptual symbols, right? So. I have an experience of Loki, right? My dog from different angles on different days, right? These related symbols become organized into a concept or simulator that allows my cognitive system to construct specific simulations of an entity or event in its absence, right? So by having different experiences of my dog, over different occasions and different days and whatnot, I will have different uh, perceptual symbols that become organized under the concept dog or even more specifically Loki, right? And for Barcelow, simulators like equivalent to concept, these are synonyms, right? I now have a concept or sim simulator dog, okay? We'll just say that the concept is dog, okay? And what this concept or simulator allows me to do now is now I can, I can cognize or think about my dog. For example, when I'm um, walking to give a lecture on campus, right? I'm, I'm, my dog is at home and I'm, I'm walking to campus and I can think about my dog. Hmm, I wonder what he's up to right now, probably chewing on something, getting into trouble, right? And I can think about the type of trouble Loki might be getting into as I'm walking to campus. Right. Or I might fall asleep. I might take a nap and dream about my dog doing certain things. OK, the point here is that once I've had enough related perceptual experiences, I can organize them under that concept or simulator. And that simulator will have some generative power and then I can use it to think about different um, possible situations. OK. My concept or simulator of a dog allows me to think about my dog, even when my dog's not there. And for Barcelow, a concept or simulator is the knowledge and accompanying processes 
that allow an individual to re represent some kind of entity or event adequately. Okay, so how do you know when you've acquired a concept or simulator sufficiently well, right? Like, how do you know if you've um, acquired the concept or simulator doc, right? Well, if we can get along in our exchanges fluidly enough that there's no misfires, right? Like when you say, I have a dog and I say, oh, I have one too. And we try to talk, we just try to uh, converse about dogs. It happens in an intelligible way. Like we can talk about how they bark and, you know, wag their tails and like to play catch and like to chew on our shoes and all these things, right? Our concepts align with each other, right? Not because in our mind, we each have something like the right predicate logic, right? Like a, a certain definition that picks out uniquely dogs and only dogs, right? It's not that we, I have this in my mind and you have that in your mind. And because the predicate logic in our minds are identical that we therefore are able to communicate. Rather, on the perceptual symbol systems view, it's just that our simulators are tuned well enough that we don't run into any problems, right? And so notice the important thing here is that on this view, our simulators may not be identical to each other, right? Like my simulator for dog may be slightly different than yours, but for the most part, right? They they're well enough aligned, right? that as we communicate as interlocutors in a common culture, that our exchanges are fluid and without any problems, okay? So you can see like how you might wanna always be thinking to yourself, like what kind of theory do I find most reasonable, right? What kind of theory should we aim for here in cognitive science, right? Are our mental representations, right? The format of our cognitions such that what I think must be identical to what you think and what you and I think must map onto some like definition or predicate logic? Or is it more realistic that our minds are just tuned well enough together, right? That we can behave in accordance with each other and sort of get by that way, right? In like a more practical, sort of sense, okay? And um, based on your view, right, your commitments and your view of what, what humans are and what the mind is, right? Uh, you may aim for a different sort of theory, right? You may find that if you're really coming from computer science and you have a commitment to minds being machines, right? You may aim for something like an amodal view, right? Um, on the other hand, if you're using like biological systems, maybe you're, you're trying to get to human cognition from like an animal model, then you can sort of see why you might wanna use something more like a perceptual symbols sort of view, right? So, you know, there's always sort of different reasons why thinkers are committed to different views, right? And that's why as cognitive scientists, we always have to read widely and try to converge on the most reasonable view that can account for the most data, okay? All right, so for bar Salau, right? Our concepts or simulators of things in the world are sort of just like extractions from the world and uh, symbols that we have um, created, right? Like we're organizing these experiences into perceptual symbols into um, an organized concept or simulator, okay? The concept or simulator importantly does not just include uh, descriptions of properties, right? Notice that on the amodal view that what was included in the representation, right? So, here on the amodal symbol systems view, what's included in the representation is a description of some sort, right? So let's see, where does it say that? Right here, right? The basic assumption underlying amodal symbol systems 
is that perceptual states are transduced into a completely new representational system that describes these states amodally, right? So what's included in the representational format here is something like a description, an abstract description, right? Of something like properties, right? Like that this thing has legs, that it has a seat, that it has a back, right? And we're sort of like con conjoining these abstract properties into the X, into the thing that is the possessor of those properties, right? On the perceptual symbol systems view, it doesn't, our concept or simulator doesn't just include abstract properties. Importantly, a simulator or concept is also capable of capturing affordances from perception and action, okay? And this is something that is not included in the amodal view, okay? So it's on the perceptual symbol systems view that the concept or simulator also captures affordances from perception and action, okay? And this is a, a very cool concept, the concept of an affordance. Uh, J.J. Gibson did a, a great job of articulating the concept of affordance, and I like to talk about it in some of my work as well, okay? So, for example, my concept or simulator for dog doesn't just capture detached physical properties of dogs, right? Like that dogs have tails and that they're three-dimensional and that they have these sort of properties, right? Just brute physical properties that exist in space-time. But rather, the my concept or simulator of dog also includes the fact that my dog is huggable and that my dog solicits hugging for me, right? There's something part of the concept dog for me, right? That includes huggable, huggability, right? Or that includes certain dispositions for action as part of the concept, right? When I hear dog, or if I see an image of a dog, it's like almost automatic that I smile, right? It's because it solicits action for me. Just like the concept apple, right? When I Think about an apple, right? In the concept, it's not just a, a brute detached object in space time, right? Rather, an, opta, an, op, um, an apple is an object that's graspable to me, right? It's an object that affords eating for me, right? An apple is first and foremost uh, delicious and something that can satisfy my hunger. Right. And then maybe in like a derivative way, it's an object that has mass and exists in time. Right. But the thing here is that in our concept of Apple, it includes not just properties in an abstract sense, but it also includes affordances for perception and action. OK, that the Apple is graspable to me by my hand, that it's edible to me for my body when I'm hungry. And just like if you were starving in the desert, when you first see water, right? Say you're thirst, you're dying of thirst in the desert and you see water for the first time, right? You're gonna be like, right? Like the first thing you might feel is like something in your throat and like, ah, relief that there's something that's gonna quench your thirst, right? The, what you're not perceiving immediately is like, hmm, uh, some, entity in space time with these properties and then maybe through abstract inferences I can arrive at uh, a conclusion that it's drinkable right here the we're trying to pack in into the concept those action and action relevant and uh, perceptually relevant affordances for us okay so if you think that that's important, that concept should have this, then you'll be interested in this perceptual symbol systems view or other views from like ecological psychology, okay? All right. Um, so we see that there's gonna be a richer notion of a concept here for the perceptual symbol systems. 
Okay. Um, the simulator produces, like the concept or simulator is what produces simulations, right? It's my concept of dog that allows me to produce different instances of dogs in my mind, right? Like Loki in different positions. And um, this is always partial and ske sketchy, never complete, right? Like unlike my perceptual experience of my dog, which is in some sense complete, right? It's like full. Um, I'm in some sense being granted access to the world when I look at my dog. But when I am thinking about my dog, this is gonna be in some sense like a partial sketch, right? And that's not a bad thing. It's because my cognition or what's in my mind is a partial sketch that it can be a model and be moved and changed and I can do productive things with it, right? So it's, it's sketchy uh, partial nature that gives me productive power over it, okay? So although the, um, the simulation is always partial and sketchy, that's not a bad thing, right? If what was stored was fully complete, then I, in some sense, like a slab, right? I couldn't do anything with that slab, but just like look at it in its completeness, okay? Um, importantly, a simulator, right? When I am simulating the, my simulator that allows me to simulate is both a rational and, a, and an empirical system, okay? So again, we're trying to not reject um, rationalism or um, the amodal view 100%, right? We're trying to retain the insights from rationalistic philosophy and amodal views in psychology. Um, we're trying to sort of take the both, the best of both worlds, right? Uh, retain productivity from rationalism and amodal theories, but then also try to combine them with an empirical part, right? So this view is both rational and empirical, reflecting integrated genetic and experiential histories, okay? So there's gonna be some, right? we're not gonna say that we don't need brains, right? <laughs> of course we need, there's some genetic basis for cognition, right? Um, you can't just pick up a soda can and boom, right? There's some, genetic requirement, but also some experiential requirement too, okay? And this view is gonna to try to make the best out of both of those. And Barslaw suggests that the very goal of human learning, the primary goal of human learning is to establish such simulators or concepts, right? In our cognition, okay? And when we are learning as fellow members of a community, right? Like we're all students in a cognitive science course. What we're doing is sort of fine tuning our concept or simulators, right? Such that they agree with each other, okay? And also with the world that we study, okay? And this is the goal of education, right? The primary goal of human learning is to uh, fine tune our simulators or concepts, both with the world and with each other, okay? And just to introduce some more terminology, Barslaw calls a frame an integrated system of perceptual symbols that are used to construct specific simulations of a category. Okay, so I have like all these perceptual symbols of Loki, right? Like uh, his nose, his tongue, his eyes, his ears, right? I have all these parts, right? And what I do is I, I construct it into something like a frame, right? Like um, him in a, in a healthy configuration, right? I could imagine him being hit by a car and maybe, you know, his leg got chopped off. Like, oh my, that would be horrible, right? I can imagine that, but I can also imagine him whole and healthy. And that would sort of be like a default frame of how I imagine my dog, right? And now I'm down imagining, I'm, I have the frame of him, um, in a default position, right? Like you might imagine him like in a textbook, just sort of standing there on all fours with 
you know, just his tongue hanging out, right? But then we can create simulations from that, right? Like I can then imagine him now he's starting to run and, right? And then there's a car that's coming and he needs to run out of the way, right? And so we're using that frame to construct mental simulations, right? And we do this all the time, right? Think about how, how often you imagine or create scenarios in your head, right? Uh, often including other people, like, ah, oh, I wonder what they're doing right now or what they think about me or whatnot, right? We engage in mental simulation all the time, right? And for Barcelona, this is an account to explain um, how we do this and what we're doing when we do this, okay? All right, so just to, um, one of the main goals for today is just to make clear the distinction between amodal symbol systems and modal symbol systems or perceptual symbol systems, okay? So here's just another distinction that I want us to be clear about today. Amodal symbol systems support what's called the impenetrability hypothesis, okay? And the impenetrability hypothesis maintains that the symbol system underlying higher cognition has little or no impact on processing and sensory or motor systems because these systems are encapsulated from each other, okay? Remember when we talked about Jerry Fodor's theory of cognitive modules, right? We covered some of the main properties of modules that these were encapsulated from each other, right? Like the vision module, the module responsible for vision is distinct and encapsulated from the module responsible for audition or language or whatnot, right? Um, so on that view, right, the higher cognitive system, right, is encapsulated and detached from the sensory and motor system, therefore, there is an impenetrability, right, between those systems, right? Like the sensory and motor system cannot penetrate the cognitive system and the cognitive system cannot penetrate the sensory and motor systems, okay? So that's what's meant by the impenetrability hypothesis, okay? And the amodal symbol systems view is committed to this impenetrability hypothesis. On the other hand, perceptual symbol systems rejects the impenetrability hypothesis, right? According to perceptual symbol systems, the constructor, construction of a simulator assumes that sensory motor systems are penetrable, right? What we're doing in higher order cognition, like when I'm thinking about Loki, right? I'm thinking about what he's doing right now, right? I am drawing upon sensory motor information in my cognition, right? Remember even that the nature of my cognition is such that my uh, concept or simulator includes affordances for action, right? So it's part of my simulation of Loki that there's an, um, an affordance or a solicitation to action, right? Like to hug my dog, right? Or to, you know, there's, part of my concept or simulation of apples is that they solicit, gra solicit graspability or edibility, okay? Part of my concept or simulation of water is that it um, affords satisfaction of my thirst, okay? And so on this view, we see that on the perceptual symbol systems view, we see that they reject the impenetrability hypothesis, right? On this view, the systems are penetrable, right? There's sort of um, penetration from cognition down to um, perception and action, and there's penetration from sensory systems and motor systems into cognitive systems, right? Because the cognitive system is using, right? This um, perception and action as part of its content, okay? So, uh, perceptual symbol system suggests that during perceptual experience, association areas in the brain capture bottom-up patterns of activation in sensory motor areas, and then subsequently, in a top-down manner, association areas are partially reactivated, right? They partially reactivate 
sensory motor areas to implement perceptual symbols. Okay, and I'm going to show you in the next few slides a figure that uh, makes this clear. Okay. Uh, before we move on to the next slide, I just want to emphasize that because perceptual symbols reside in sensory motor systems, running a simulator or a concept involves a partial running of sensory motor systems in a top-down manner. Okay. Hence, penetrability for perceptual symbol systems. All right, so here I'll talk about the perception and then re-simulation, okay? But first, before we get here, I wanna just discuss like, what do we want from a fully conceptual system? Okay. So as we think about like these views, the amodal symbol systems view and the perceptual symbol systems view, we should be thinking about what is required for a fully functional conceptual system. Here's what Barcelau suggests, okay? So according to Barcelau, a fully functional conceptual system should satisfy at least these requirements and maybe more. A fully functional conceptual system should be capable of representing abstract concepts. So concepts such as justice and love. It should also be capable of representing types and tokens. Right, so a type would be like yellow labs, that's a type of thing. And then my dog, my particular dog is a token, like it's an, an instance of the type. A conceptual system should also be capable of representing propositions. For example, cognitive science is awesome. Conceptual systems should also be capable of producing categorical inferences, right? So yellow labs are mortal, Adam's dog is a yellow lab, therefore Adam's dog is mortal. And fully functional conceptual systems should be capable of combining symbols productively. For example, cognitive science and yellow labs are awesome. Okay, so we see here that in articulating some of the requirements for a fully functional conceptual system, we're deriving some of the great insights from amodal symbol systems, right? We're just going to try to satisfy these requirements of the conceptual system through a more modal approach, okay? Uh, an approach that is more congenial with or compatible with the sensory and the motor systems, okay? The theory of perceptual symbol systems aims to provide a high level functional account of how the brain could implement a conceptual system using sensory motor mechanisms. This is a great example of interdisciplinary work in cognitive science that is well informed by theoretical work in philosophy, as well as empirical work in psychology and neuroscience. So one of the great things about this article and why that I wanted you to read this article in this course and why I wanted you to focus on just this article for this lecture is because I think it's a great example of work in cognitive science, right? In that it's philosophical, right? And in order for a work to be philosophical, it doesn't have to be purely speculative or ignore empirical data, right? Some philosophers think that if you're talking about empirical data, that for some reason, this can't be a philosophical paper. And I think that that's absolutely wrong, okay? And this is a great example, Barcelau is a great example of how you can discuss the different views in the philosophy, right? He situates his view against other philosophical views, right? Like views proposed by, by Jerry Fodor, Xenon Pilishin, uh, British empiricists, rationalist philosophers, right? So. Barcelau knows his philosophy and situates his work philosophically, but also his view is compatible, right, with empirical data, right? And it helps to explain a wide range of empirical data. And it helps to predict and anticipate future findings, 
right? So there's an exp there's an explanatory power to the theory here, right? That makes it a, a strong theory, right? And it makes it a stronger theory than other theories that do not enjoy its explanatory power, okay? So I think that this is a great example of strong theoretical work, okay? But also it does its homework empirically and that it's going to, in order to articulate the model, right? For example, in order to articulate how perceptual symbol systems can be productive and is not just a, a, a form of brute empiricism, right? Which, is, which views experience as just a recording system, right? So in order to negotiate between that, that fine line, right? To say, I'm an empiricist, but not, committed to the recording view of experience, right? We have to um, really know our, the experimental findings as well, right? We have to know um, about the productive nature of cognition. We have to know what's going on with uh, sensory and sensory systems. We have to know about long-term memory, right? We have to know that, okay, long-term memory is such a thing that it can store these, um, these symbols from perception, right? And we have, to, um, we have to just have a nice firm understanding of lots of different aspects of psychology and a lot of different empirical findings from psychology and neuroscience to tie this article together in a coherent way, okay? And you'll see that as you read through it, he's citing sources from neuroscience, right? Like look what Damasio found in this study, right? He's citing sources from cognitive psychology, right? The nature of schemas and representations, but then also philosophy, okay? And uh, his view is coherent and comprehensive. And that's why it's so well cited in the literature, okay? So I think this is a great example of work that, great work in cognitive science. And we don't, get so much of that, right? We, we get a lot of instances of great studies like empirical study in neuroscience or a great philosophical paper, right? But we don't as often get a great interdisciplinary piece that can tie like all the branches of cognitive science together, okay? So I encourage you to read this article thoroughly, okay? And, and try to aim uh, for such comprehensiveness in your own thinking. Okay. All right, so here on this figure, we have an example of sensory representations and reenactments. This will just help us get clear on the view, perceptual symbol systems view. Okay, so first we have physical stimuli, right? Like you go outside and you look at your car or you go outside and you see several cars. That would be your physical stimuli, okay? And then we have a sort of sensory representation, right? You're gonna have some representation in terms of, um, you're not gonna store the car in your mind, but there's gonna be some like, some things that your sensory equipment does, right? As a response to that uh, visual, physical stimuli, okay? And for example, this would be things that we talked about here, when we're talking about sensory representations, here I want you to think back to an, our lecture on the visual and auditory system, okay? So that's what's going on here at that level, right? We have sort of that from the physical stimuli, we have like our uh, visual system and our auditory system uh, taking in those in terms of sensory representations, okay? Then shared conjunctive neurons in an association area integrate sensory representations across category instances, okay? So the sensory representations happen at a, right, at a, at a we're, we're gonna take information from like primary visual cortex and primary auditory cortex and then association areas, right, we're gonna, sort of conjoin things together, okay? There's 
conjunctive neurons and association areas that integrate these sensory representations across category instances. Okay, and this is sort of like how it goes in, right? And then when you want to think about cars, right, you're going to simulate a car in your mind, right? Um, you're going to then pro produce different simulations with your concept or simulator. And that's what's shown on the right-hand figure or figure B, okay? Is that with these shared conjunctive neurons in association areas that have actively stored sensory representations, they will then produce these sensory reenactments, okay? All right, and how this view, the perceptual symbol systems view is distinct from the amodal symbol systems view is just made clear on this next slide, right? So again, for the perceptual symbol systems view, we have the physical stimulus, then information travels up sensory channels, neurons in feature maps fire to produce a sensory representation then conjunctive neurons in an association area capture the sensory representation. Okay, and then when we reenact or we re-simulate our concept of car, conjunctive neurons in the association area fire to partially reactivate the earlier sensory representations. And neurons in feature maps fire to reenact the earlier sensory representation, okay? Now in the amodal symbol systems view, right? We see that here, there is no similar role for conjunctive neurons in the association areas, okay? But rather we have like a semantic network and frame, right? Here we have, because of the transduction process, right? We have physical stimuli that is transduced into a non-physical format, right? So in your mind, it's stored as in the form of like predicate logic or a semantic network or what have you, okay? And then when you are cognizing, right? When you're thinking about cars or whatnot, you're thinking about that in this way, right? Predicate logic, propositional logic, what have you, okay? So we see that the nature of cognition is very different here. The nature and the format of cognition is very different on the perceptual symbol systems view and the amodal symbol systems view, right? Recall that the focus of our lecture today is not on the implementation level of analysis, but on the algorithmic level of analysis, right? Or in other words, today we're thinking about like the format of cognition, right? The representational format, right? And what it boils down to is, do we think that the representational format of cognition is more perceptual, more connected to perception and action, or do we think it's more amodal or arbit and arbitrary, right? In the form of like a predicate logic, right? Do we think that the mind is really like a computer? Right? Or do we think that the mind is more in line with like how other animals, non-human animals, how their biological systems might work, right? So I think that the, this is a fascinating debate, right? And we can continue to think about these questions throughout the course, right? Like when we get to evolution, we can ask what makes mo the most sense, right? In an evolutionary, an evolutionary framework, what makes the most sense? A perceptual symbol systems view of cognition or an amodal symbol systems view of cognition? We might find that within the framework of evolution and natural selection, right? That a perceptual symbol systems view fits better with that sort of story, right? Because then we can say how cognition sort of evolved or it is at least continuous with perception and action, right? Whereas the amodal view, it becomes challenging to see how it fits, right? How does this very different format 
interact with and even originate from systems that are of a very different type of format, right? Perception and action, right? So when we think about evolution and our anthropological approaches to cognition, we might lean again more towards the perceptual symbol systems approach. However, right, when we get to artificial intelligence and more computational approaches, we might find that again, there's more to love about the amodal systems approach, right? There's some things that we like about working with amodal symbol systems, right? And it we may not be able to ditch the important insights from amodal symbol systems, right? Like productivity and the importance of um, being able to capture abstract ideas and concepts, okay? So uh, the, the goal of the lecture today wasn't to refute the amodal symbol systems view or the perceptual symbol systems view, but just to present both views to you and by contrasting the perceptual symbol systems view with the amodal symbol systems view to clarify what Barcelona is trying to do in this article, okay? All right, and this is just a final slide to reiterate sort of the main view of perceptual symbol systems, okay? And just remember, what's this view committed to? Perceptual symbol systems. This view is committed to the view that symbols are modal, right? In the sense that they are represented in the same systems as the perceptual states that produce them, okay? Also, perceptual symbol systems um, are committed to the view that symbols are analogical, okay? In the sense that the structure of a symbol corresponds at least somewhat to the perceptual state that produced it, okay? This is distinct from the amodal view, which believes that uh, symbol systems are amodal and that symbols are arbitrary, okay? All right, so, I hope you enjoyed this lecture on perceptual symbol systems, and this has motivated you to think whether your mental representations are analogical and modal as this view suggests they are, okay? Um, as we continue on the next lecture on evolution, we'll have an opportunity to further think about these views, okay? So thank you so much for your attention today. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our next lecture.